Last week, we talked about the power of our words, and um, we talked about things we, I, I said, and, and English people hated it, I think. I said, don't say what doesn't need to be said, but do say what does need to be said. That was basically the gist of it. And I think that was pretty simple. There's a lot of simple things that you can pull out of the book of James. And um, the one of the things I love about preaching, teaching through books of the Bible is when you really get a glimpse of the context, just the historical context and the, the original audience, the original hearers, when they would hear um, a book or a letter, um, and then you take kind of what they are experiencing, because James was written to uh, basically house churches, basically scattered Jewish Christian house churches. And as they would get this letter, uh, like the letters from Paul and the letters from uh, other letters that we find in the New Testament, the, the church would come together and they would basically say, hey, the leaders would say, hey, we have a, we have a letter from Paul or we have something from Peter or James. And, and the church would get together and somebody would stand and they would read the whole thing. And so the original context of these Jewish Christians that are scattered abroad all over the place due to persecution, this dispersion that's kind of caused people to, let's move out of town because it's getting hot and heavy in Jerusalem and the Palestine area, so let's leave. And so what I, what I love about preaching through a, a book like this in a small setting with you guys is to think and imagine being one of those first hearers as they're hearing some of these things. And James hit something tonight that we looked at that he brushed across a little bit, but in everything that you interact with, with your life and faith, this is something that is incredibly important, and that's wisdom. Wisdom. So we're going to look at wisdom tonight. We know that wisdom, obviously, biblical wisdom, is critical because the Bible is replete with things about wisdom. Verses, sayings, uh, instructions regarding wisdom. Uh, but wisdom is one of those things, like a, a lot of things we read and we study through Scripture, sometimes wisdom is kind of tricky. You're like, am I, how do I know that I'm being wise? I mean, one of those things, like, like if you're doing something wrong, like stealing, you know you stole something because you took that thing and you got it, and that's wrong. That's, that's a clearly something you did wrong. But wisdom is one of those things where, like, you want it, you need it. We all need it. But how do you really define it? And, that's, and so... What I'm going to talk about tonight, we'll talk through four traits of wisdom from above, four traits from wisdom from above. We'll look at this passage, and this passage gives us four traits. Let's look at this passage, though, in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, just to, just to kind of highlight what I said earlier about how the Bible is pretty clear that wisdom is incredibly important. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2, my son, if you receive my words... And you treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand and the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So what we have is that's just a little glimpse to what we find in Scripture, especially like Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, some of these other books that are entitled wisdom literature. So the Bible has a lot in the Scriptures about wisdom. And so obviously biblical wisdom is absolutely critical for our lives. James uses it. I mean, he's only got a few chapters that he gives to the people, these scattered Jewish Christians that we have today. We're not Jewish Christians, but we're in a sense, kind of longing for something more, like kind of wishing for home, kind of knowing that, the, that, that we're kind of passing through this area, this life. I've always kind of felt like I'm just kind of here for a moment, just kind of passing through. And here James gives us some insight. Here's some things that needs to mark your life, and wisdom is very critical. So tonight, we're talking about four tra traits of wisdom from above. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into James chapter 3. God, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for uh, your in instruction. God, I thank you for the, the treasure trove that it gives us. And Lord, we all need wisdom. So God, I pray that tonight's message would be applied to our hearts and to our minds as we seek you, God, as we seek to grow in wisdom. So for your word tonight, God, I pray that you would, God, just give us what we need. Let us hear what we need to hear. 
is behold what we need to behold. Find fertile ground in our hearts to be receptive for your word. So open up our eyes and give us ears to hear. We love you. We pray this in your good name. Amen. So we're in James chapter 3. We'll be in verses 13 through 18. We're going to break it up a little bit. Obviously, if you've been around me enough to know, I interrupt myself a lot when we're talking through Scripture. So the first thing, first trait of wisdom that we're going to look at tonight, trait number one of wisdom from above, trait number one is wisdom works. Wisdom works. Now, I don't want you to say that five times fast because then you just sound goofy, but wisdom works. Now, what I mean by that, let's look at this passage right here in verse 13, James chapter 3, verse 13. The Bible tells us this, who is wise and understanding among you? So there's the question. Who is it? Who's wise among you? Who has understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness and wisdom. So here's what happens. A lot of the times people in our culture and people even in, in churches, we kind of think that, oh, if somebody is, and this is not picking on elderly at all. A lot of times, and I've heard this, a lot of times people would say, well, they're older, so they must be wise. Now, a lot of people can grow old, but just because somebody gets old does not mean they're wise at all. And I've met a lot of people, young people, very young, and I've thought, you are wise for your age. And here's why. So wisdom and understanding, if somebody gets it, if somebody turns their attention to Scripture, to the gospel, to the Bible, and what the Word of God says, and they get it, then it turns into action and deed and works. That's wisdom. So if somebody, if somebody thinks that they can just sit behind a desk and read and study and know Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and all kinds of languages, and they have all of this wisdom and knowledge, but, it, but they don't put feet to that. They don't put sweat to it like many of us saw Saturday as we were pouring out these lava rocks at this school. Wisdom is great, and understanding is profitable and helpful for everyone, but it has to it has to be it's by good conduct. Let him show his works in meekness. So wisdom, first thing, wisdom works. Wisdom from above is like an activator. Take wisdom from above. You just need to mix it with everything. <clears throat> there's, a, there's like glue compounds, like epoxy. If you ever mix epoxy, those two things, you mix them up and you stick it on something, and that is going to hold. You have those two compounds. If you just put one on there, it doesn't stick to anything. You put them together, and you better fasten that thing, whatever, you're wanting to stick together quick. I had a picture sent to me the other day from a friend, and it was a picture of me and a couple other people. And the, the question was, hey, do you remember what we were doing here? That's usually kind of scary for me when somebody sends me a picture. Hey, do you remember what was happening in this picture? And I sent back one of those, what do they call it, the little... GIF, GIFs, or whatever. I'm old, too old to know the right thing. I should know that. I partially teach in middle school. I should know the right word. So I just sent back like the giant mushroom cloud. And I said, yes, we should have an explosion reunion. What we did is we took a bottle and we took certain materials, put them in the bottle, tightened it, shook it, rolled it, and ran. And it was terrifying. It blew up. It was loud and awesome, actually. Wisdom is like the ingredient that you mix it with everything. Add a healthy dose <clears throat> of biblical wisdom, and it changes everything. It makes that compound stick. So we need wisdom because that stuff really works. Okay, I was thinking about just that statement, that stuff works. And I was, um, <clears throat> you know, I get kind of chased rabbit trails sometimes and I was Googling, like, what's some of the uh, best inventions or some of the craziest things that people have come up with that, that actually really work. And uh, I don't know if you, you probably never do stuff like this because you have, you know, more things to do than me, I guess. The wheel was number one, like the most important invention, the wheel. The next one, what do you think was? The nail. The nail was really important. The compass was one of them on there. The printing press which absolutely revolutionized the known world when the printing press came out. Johann Gutenberg, right? History class. And then I was thinking, all right, so what are some silly things? 
that people have invented. And I mean, so there's a lot on, online that you can look. Like there's actually threads that you can look at, like stuff you can buy on Amazon right now that you're looking at. You're like, I don't know. I don't know about that. And some of these I looked at, like that's ridiculous. But then some of you are like, somebody sat there and thought about that. They're like, that would really work. Like the keyboard goo, okay? So you know how I hate slime. Like kids make slime, but they make this certain type of slime that you just set it on your keyboard. You just peel it off, and it pulls all the dust and stuff out, right? Clean your keyboard. Charcoal toothpaste. We have that at my house. I'm not really convinced that that works yet. It's really weird. Uh, A stainless steel bar. You can buy a stainless steel, just a bar, and you can use it to, like, wash things and rub on you. Some people say, I'd replace my deodorant with a stainless steel bar. They have also probably don't have too many friends still. I don't know about that. Travel pillow. I saw a travel pillow with a hood attached to it. So you can, like, have this giant pillow with a hood, and you would look really cool. Um, check this out. There's, they, they make this grilled cheese toaster bag. I think that's pretty smart. So you make your grilled che- grill cheese. You put it in this toaster bag, and then the bag and everything, you slide it in the toaster, push it down, and wait for magic to happen. That's pretty smart. People have come up with a lot of good stuff. I don't know if all that stuff works, but what I do know works is in my life, wisdom has been an absolute critical compound. And I've tried my hardest to take wisdom and mix it with, with everything, every decision, Every encounter that I have with people, everything, is so important because so many things in your life hinge upon some decision you make, and your decisions better be mixed in with that beautiful, holy, volatile compound with wisdom. Wisdom works. It works because it it changes things. Add that compound to it, and it helps things. Take a, take a group of people that are trying to walk with God, and trying to do what God wants them to do, and, and add somebody in that small group that has a lot of biblical wisdom. Man, that's a force to be reckoned with. Get some people who are real fired up, real passionate, and you add somebody in there that's just full of wisdom. Just step back. Mix that together, step back, and watch what happens. Wisdom works in your life. Like it works. It fixes things. What about like relational tension? I know no, nobody in here has ever had any relational tension. Add a little, little wisdom to it like Proverbs says in Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. You ever been in an argument? You ever gotten yourself in trouble with a friend? co-worker, spouse, and you, you back up a little bit after the dust has kind of settled, and you're like, man, I should have just kept my mouth shut. I bet if you mixed a little wisdom in there before, wise choices bring honor to your family and joy to your family. Proverbs 10.1, the proverb of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is sorrow to his mother. Hey, man, that stuff works. That wisdom Put it on everything, man. Mix it in there with everything. It works. Tony, right? Tony says it's good on everything. Wisdom is good on everything. Mix it in with everything, every part of your life. Now, here's the thing. A lot of you can sit there for a minute, if I let you, and you can start thinking about all like the little compartments that you have in your life, okay? Whether it's how you are at home, how you are at work, how you are at church, how you are with your friends, when you're vegging out, relaxing, that kind of thing. So think, just do a quick inventory of your life, really quick, and how much wisdom are you concerned about mixing in with, with, all that, with all the areas and all the arenas of your life? And I hope, I hope that you're like, I, I really want wisdom in all those sectors of my life, all those sections in my life, whether it's with my family or, or at home, that kind of thing. Because here's, when, when we look, when we say wisdom works, when it says the wise man will show his wisdom by his actions, by his conduct, every area of your life, people watch you. And pay attention to how you understand things, how you deal with things, how you interact with other things, how you react to every situation. People watch you. People watch me. Wisdom works. Add it to everything. Add an abundance of wisdom to your life. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where there is no guidance, a people fall. But 
in an abundance of counselors, there's safety. I've used this verse before. I've heard people tell me this verse before as they're asking me for advice. I love hearing somebody come up to me and say, hey, I need to run something by, by you. Tell me what you think. And it happened a lot at my last church. Pastor Tony Carnes was the pastor there. And people would come up to me and say, hey, I need to ask you something. And they'd ask me something real quick, and I'd say something. And they're like, yeah, that's just what Tony said to me. Good. Now, I wasn't like, well, I should have listened to him. I was like, good. I'm glad you asked me too. Because you're seeking wisdom in all the, like, the, the, the wise pots that are out there in your life. Like, dip into those things. And mix wisdom in with everything. Because it works. It really does work. That stuff really works. Okay? I mean it. Wisdom works. It changes your life. It changes how you act and interact with everything. Now, and I'm trying to emphasize this because here's what I would love for everybody to do when you leave here. Is to realize how important wisdom is in your life. And when you realize how critical something is in your life, you think about it more. So here, here's just a quick, another quick inventory for you real quick. In the last month, when's the last time you just paused and you were like, okay, God. What I need a lot of right now is just wisdom. And like that was like the critical moment in your brain, in your thought process. I really need some wisdom right now. Now, that doesn't mean that nothing's going on in your last month. Like maybe not, maybe not a lot was happening in your last month. But there's enough that happened in your last month for you need to, everybody in here to need wisdom. Everybody. Everybody. Number two, wisdom fights. So wisdom works, wisdom fights. James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. Pick it back up with our friend James. He says this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. This is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will also be disorder in every vile practice. So here's what's happening right now in your hearts, whether you realize it or not. There's a war. There's a, there's a, there's a battle raging on in your mind. And when you leave here, the battle probably heats up a little bit more. Now, wisdom fights. If there's some kind of situation going on in your heart, your mind, or something happening, and you don't know how to interact with it, wisdom works like we talked about. Like it changes your conduct, changes how you interact with things. And if there's a fight, you better work up a big old batch of wisdom and put it in there. And the Bible talks a lot about just the reality of spiritual warfare around us. And we don't always see it. A lot of times, you know, when we, when we think spiritual warfare, we think, well, so there's demonic activity. And really, Hollywood, movies, has changed the way we should think about that. We think that, okay, so there's demonic activity in the house because chairs are sliding across the floor. Like, Satan doesn't want to do that. He thinks that's stupid. Like, he would watch those movies and be like, that's so dumb. They think that's demonic activity? Good. I got it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle and fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When's the last time you visualized in your, like, with your literal eyes, when's the last time you've seen that fight? Some of y'all like to watch fights, UFC, boxing, or stuff like that. I like that sometimes. It gives me a headache most of the time because I'm like this the whole time. I'm like tapping out and throwing in the towel and stressing out. But what about like the spiritual fight that's happening like all around us? Like there's, you, you might not realize it, but there's probably something raging on in your life. I mean, if, if, if we think, Unless we think Paul is like, well, he's exaggerating a little bit. He's kind of out there on this. Or he's right. And there is a fight that's not against flesh and blood. 
but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers, this present darkness. First Peter 5, 8 says, look, be sober-minded. It says, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Look at these terms in that verse that, that James uses. And in verse 14 through 16 of chapter 3, he uses terms like bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, boasting, false to the truth, earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Those are things. Here's what happens when you read through the, that list right there. That's not really something that you're like, yeah, so-and-so needs to be here listening to this because they're very demonic. Right? Those are some of those things that you're like, I don't know if I know anybody that's raging with selfish ambition. Like, what does that even look like? But there's a fight happening. And look, if wisdom in my life is like a warrior that will go to battle with me with maybe sharper weapons than I have, hey, bring that, bring that to the fight. Because wisdom helps you fight. And when you read through these verses about Satan roaring around, around like, a, like a prowling lion seeking to devour. And of what Paul said in, against the rulers and authority. Like that kind of sounds scary. That kind of sounds like that should be terrifying. But it isn't scary. That should never be something that. We in faith should be like, oh, no. And when I leave here, there's a lion waiting for me in the parking lot. No, but in Christ, we can confidently walk in this life wherever we go. Walk with wisdom. Wisdom fights with you. Look at this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Wisdom fights. And we walk in wisdom, so we fight the spiritual battles in our life with wisdom. In our fight, it's real. It's an internal fight. It's an external fight. You ever lost a fight? Anybody ever been, like I've been in fist fights, you know. Some of y'all have, some of y'all haven't. I've lost them. Had lost all of them. But there's other fights. Mental fights. You ever been throwing blows with yourself in here? Woohoo! That's a scary fight. Relational, spiritual, emotional. Like, if you just realize how much of a fighter that wisdom is in your life, what would you do? What you would do is be like, I'm going to mix more wisdom up in there. Shake it up. Keep it in there. Wisdom is a fighter. And usually, wisdom is a fighter by helping remove the fight. But we have to remind ourselves that, you know, in, in our spiritual warfare, what we get tangled up with, and look, we're not fighting. Our fight is not like towards victory, like we're fighting to win something. No, our fight is from victory because Jesus has already won the victory. The wise and gentle Savior, he fought the fight for us, and he won in the deepest sense of wisdom possible. He's accomplished, and he's beat every fight that you'll ever face. He's already won. So what we should do is we should walk our lives in wisdom. Just walk in wisdom. The fight is raging on. Ephesians chapter 5. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus there. But the word of God is speaking to us today as well. The days are evil. So we should use the best use of our time. As we fight this fight, as we live this life... We need to pile on wisdom. You need more wisdom in your life. Do you, re you realize that by now? Wisdom actually works. You need that. Number three, wisdom waits. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, 
impartial and sincere. Think about the wisest people you know in your life. Just think about that for a minute. Here's what they do. They wait. You notice that? The wisest people in your life, they don't blow up and react. If that's the wisest person in your life, you need more people in your life. They're calm. They bring a sense of calm. With, if there's some kind of war going on, whatever, whatever's raging on, you, it's like they walk into the room and it's like, oh, they're here. Yay. The, the wisdom that they offer just pours out this, this peace because wisdom waits. The wise person, the wisest person in your life, you know what they also are? The, the most patient person. And we struggle with patience. That's something all of us can be like, yeah, I really struggle with patience. I don't, really know, I don't really know if I struggle with wisdom or not. If you've really struggled with patience, then you have a wisdom problem too. Mix that stuff in, folks. Wisdom works. Hey, apply it. It fights for you. It's fighting your fight tonight, I hope. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. When you talk about wisdom being pure, wisdom from above, it says first it's pure, then it's peaceful, then it's gentle, then it's open to reason. It's also full of mercy and good fruits. That there's a beginning of that, that purity of wisdom. There's this reverence for God. That's why the Bible said multiple times the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. You realize how magnificent God is and how majestic and amazing he is and how lofty he is in your heart and your mind and you have him so high and lifted up. You realize how small you are and you realize how small you are. That doesn't make you weaker. doesn't make you, you know, you know sheepish and going to be destroyed by everything that comes your way. No, that makes you stronger because you're beginning to understand how great and mighty God is. And with that comes wisdom. It's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason. You know people who are kind of wishy-washy all the time? Well, I don't know. I asked him the other day, but then now today he's this. Drives me crazy. They're not wise. They're one way one day, next way the next day. And but that's not wisdom. Full of mercy and good fruits. You know somebody that's full of mercy? They react and they respond to situations in your life, and you're like, I would have never done that. I'd have, told them, I'd have told them right away what I thought and how it was. Well, maybe you need to slow down a little bit. Maybe you need a little bit more wisdom to help you wait. Think about maybe a decision you've made before in your life that you just jumped into it. Man, I shouldn't have done that. Buddy, that was a bad choice. If you just take a break a little bit, take a breath, say, God, you know what? There's this in front of me. I want to walk in faith because you can't. And the thing is, like, wisdom keeps, keeps moving forward. Wisdom doesn't wait to the point to where you're standing still spiritually. I think some people are like, well, he makes, he's very wise. Like, he doesn't really jump into anything. In fact, he doesn't do anything at all. That's not wisdom. That's somebody who's scared. There's a difference between being scared and stiff spiritually, not moving a muscle in your life spiritually, not doing anything. There's a difference between that and in wisdom and in faith moving forward to what God has called you to move forward to in your life. Wisdom can make you wait, make you slow down. Quiet your thoughts. Do you ever have just the just raging thoughts in your head about what if this, what if that, what's going on here, what's going on there? If you just wait, wait on God. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this next week because I'm waiting on God with something. Just wait on him. Have faith in him. Wisdom works. Wisdom fights. Wisdom waits in this disciplined patience from above. But also wisdom produces. Wisdom produces. James 3, 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, the, this verse standing alone is a great verse. But in the context of what James is dealing with here is wisdom. Wisdom produces. There's an effect that happens. 
to take wisdom, because it does work, folks, I'm telling you. At every situation in your life, you, you, you pack it in there. And if it's some kind of spiritual warfare, it's going to knuckle up with you. It's going to fight with you. You need to slow down and just take a deep breath. Wait on God and his wisdom. You know, we make tons of decisions all the time. You make, you'll make some kind of decision or some kind of judgment. Sometimes in, in indecision is decision, too. It's a bad decision. But these judgments, these decisions that you make, you know, they affect everything. They affect everybody close to us. One of the things that I guess I kind of miss as far as being a kid is my decisions, the big decisions that I made as a kid, they didn't really affect a lot of people very big. And I made a lot of dumb decisions as a teenager. But as an adult, as a dad, as a pastor, like my decisions, they, they affect a lot of people. Stuff that I decide to do with my own life, the stuff that I decide to talk to you about, or man, we make decisions all the time. And we need wisdom. If we have wisdom in our lives, like that wisdom, that it actually produces things in our life. It's not just this compound that you put together to help situations that are falling apart in your life. It's not a trait. Wisdom's not really a character trait. Like, they're always happy. They seem like they're always grumpy. Uh, that's, that's different. Wisdom's different. You know, wisdom produces other things in your life. It's like a faucet. It's like you, you, you all have like this wisdom spigot in your heart. It's, it's there. And a, and a lot of us in here, I believe, it's turned off. But when you turn it on, you turn that faucet of wisdom in your life and that pure water, that pure flowing peace, there's a, it, it like floods the fields. It just pours forth out into the parking lot and out into the street. James, I believe, is like visualizing this. As he's talking to the first century Christians, he's saying, hey, you need wisdom in your life. And he comes to this idea, he gives us this mental picture. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace. I love that statement. I would love for all of you to live your life with such wisdom that when you get up in age and you have the gray hair to match your wisdom, and everybody that's ever known you, they, they would... They would characterize you as a person of just a wealth of wisdom. Because of your faith, you put feet and action to your faith. And your wisdom, you, you just helped other people. And, and, and who you were was like you had these faucets of wisdom that just poured out into the streets. And a harvest of righteousness was sown in peace because of you. And I want people to say that at my funeral. If just what he was involved with, it was like he just poured out just peace and wisdom and righteousness. And you know, like, I think if we, if we, we sit here long enough, we're all probably going to be like, man, I just don't have enough wisdom in my life. But you know, this harvest of righteousness, what is that? I just think that maybe that's some renewal. Some restoration that should, that should happen somewhere that's connected to you somehow. Maybe somebody in your neighborhood needs a little bit of renewal. Maybe somebody near you somebody that might be difficult to deal with. Maybe you're there. Maybe God's put you in their life to be that person of faith and wisdom. That just kind of washes over them. Even though they might be difficult. But that's not the Bible talks about with you know, patient mercy. All through wisdom. So we're all going to leave here today. My hope that everybody when you leave here today. Is that you leave with more wisdom. But also with a desire for more wisdom. And an understanding that you do need more wisdom. How? 
So how do you get it? How do you get wisdom? It is very simple. And James brushed by it in James chapter 1, verse 5. He said this, if any of you lacks wisdom, raise your hand if that's you. That's me. I'm lacking wisdom in a lot of areas of my life. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, what should you do? Let him ask God. God gives generously to all without reproach. It will be given to him. One of the things that, and I've said this to you guys, I've said this to other people, but if I were to take like the prayers in my life and stack them up, what I've prayed for the most for me personally, what I've prayed for the most is wisdom. I realize how much of an idiot I can be. Do you, like, if you call me this week, and if this looks like a telemarketer, I'm just not going to answer it, so leave me a message. Or I might answer it and be like, Homeland Security. And it gets silent, and they never call you again if you do that. But don't do that. I don't, that's probably like bad. If you call me today, or this week, or if you say, you shoot me a text, say, hey, I got a question, I'm going to ask you something. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray for wisdom. If Christian calls me this week and I see his phone number, you know what I'm going to do before I answer the phone? Here's what I'm going to say. And this is just me being really transparent with you because I literally do this. God, I'm about to ruin this conversation unless you help me. I need wisdom. Right now, I need a lot of wisdom. Hey, buddy, what's up? Oh, man, I was just in the neighborhood. What you doing? Just hanging out. All right. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> Whoa, that was life-changing, right? Could have been, though. Hey, man, what's up? It ain't good. Here's what I've been thinking. Tell me what you think. Man, I have an opportunity in that moment, and you do too, to step into somebody's life with full wisdom attached and Bring life or bring hope, bring resolve, bring peace, bring something to that situation. So we all need more wisdom. How do you get wisdom? Pray for it. Ask for wisdom. While I'm talking right now, you can quickly say a quick prayer, God, I need wisdom. You can do that. You should be praying for wisdom for your life. You need to, like, you, many of you are really connected to me in this church, and I love you and I appreciate you. I hope, and, and I would plead with you, that when you think of me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray that God would give me more wisdom. And he, you can even say this. He really needs it. You can even say that. Because I say that. <laughs> I really need wisdom. You need wisdom. Pray for wisdom for your family. Pray for wisdom for your friends. For your kids. Somebody that's Maybe a coworker, maybe your boss that you want to like not pray for. Maybe you need to pray for wisdom for that person. And then you interact with that person with wisdom. So if you're here tonight and you're like me and you need more wisdom, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to ask God for more wisdom. And maybe you're here this evening and we talk about spiritual choices and spiritual decisions and things like that. And maybe you've never really made like the first important spiritual decision. And that is the offer that we all have right now through the grace of God and the gospel. To perk up our heart's attention to the invitation that we've been extended to find our hope and our peace in the gospel. That's redemption. That's forgiveness of sin. That's what the ultimate peace is about. And that gentle, wise Savior who walked that path and made a way for us to have peace with him. And, you know, he gives us that faith to believe. He opens that door of faith in our heart because in our own strength and our own selves, we don't have the ability to do that. He has to come to us. And the Spirit of God awakens us to that truth. And what happens is we, there's the, oh, the light comes on. And we're like, wow. So now begin my spiritual journey in Christ. And that spiritual journey is the rest of your life. 
from the beginning of you stepping into faith to when you breathe your last. And every moment of that journey is filled with decisions, is filled with conversations, is filled with interactions that you have with people throughout your whole life. And your whole life is going to be marked with that person of peace just flows, just life flows out of them. And where that's going to come from is wisdom. So if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian in this place, my recommendation to you, you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to believe everything. You don't have to know everything. You might not even have to get everything. God's big enough for that. You can take that step towards him and say, you know what? I think I'm in. I want to begin my faith walk. I want to begin that journey. And you know what happens? That gentle Savior who is the perfect wisdom of God, he starts leading you. And you start growing. I think a lot of churches and a lot of people think that, okay, so they start their walk of faith, and as soon as they start it, they got to know everything, and they got to do everything right, right at the beginning. I don't know why we've started teaching people that. I think that came from our country, honestly. I don't know where, I don't know where that came from. It's not like that. Because if you think you start your faith journey and you get it all right th- from the beginning, what in the world is that? No, you start your faith journey and you realize as a humble child in the faith that you don't know what you're doing. You look up at your good father and say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to believe. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to pray. I don't know where to go. Can you lead me? And what that is doing in your heart, that's realizing where wisdom actually is, and that's from God. And what God does is he takes your hand, he leads you through life. And you come with your relationship with your heavenly father to a crossroads in your life, to a big decision in your life. And sometimes it feels like, because you've all, if you're old enough, you all have experienced this in faith. Sometimes it feels like the good, good father in a big decision kind of takes a step back. And it's kind of looking over, seeing what you'll do. Now, we can look at those moments and be like, God, where are you? I can't believe you deserted me in this moment in my life. Or we can look at those moments and be like, this is just what a good father should do. Lead me as I'm growing up in faith. And when I come to something, I have to make a choice. I have to make a decision. And your whole life is full of decisions. Little ones and big ones. My prayer tonight for all of you, because I care deeply for you, is that you'll realize that. And you'll realize how important for you to have wisdom. So take God's hand. This afternoon, take his hand. It's like, God, lead me in the way of wisdom. Confess some things. God, I don't, if, if you could sit here and say, I don't think I've ever really prayed for wisdom. How prideful and arrogant could you be? Do you really think you can just go through life and making good choices all the time on your own? How arrogant of me to do that. So I need to come before God and I need to repent. I need to cast my life down before him and say, God, I need help. Whew, I've made some mess with some decisions I've made. And here's what, here's what I plead with you. If you feel like every time you come around church or come around preaching or come around anything, it's just you always just getting thrown down in the dirt and you're like, that's where you belong. Like year after year, it's been long enough that you've been down there because everybody throws you down there. Like that's not where God wants you to stay. So the hope is that we bow before God and be like, God, I've not exercised wisdom in my life. And you know what he does? He bends down and he, he like touches, as a good father, when he touches your chin, and he picks you up. And you look at his face, and he's like, come on, we're, we're not done, let's go. We're still walking, we're still walking. So let him lead you. Let the good father lead you. Confess in your heart tonight, Lord, I really need you. I really need you.